please. My name is my name is Carlos Moreo. I'm the executive officer here at IPCS. It's great to have you all here. New faces, some faces I've seen before. And um, let me begin by um, acknowledging that we're meeting on the lands of the um, Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nation. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Sovereignty was never ceded. Um, the acknowledgement should always be a kind of a weighty, a weighty thing. So I just want to make a quick little statement about IPCS in relation to that. So IPCS, um, as a project, as a gathering community, migrant, diasporic, seeking refuge, inheriting and questioning settler histories, differently racialized, as a community that comes together to make a particular kind of intervention through its work, stands in solidarity with First Nations peoples um, and, and their struggles for social justice and decolonization here in Nam, across the continent of what we now know as Australia and overseas in Palestine, in Western Sahara, and in many other political elsewheres. So once again, welcome. Um, let me say a couple of very brief things about tonight and about IPCS before I pass the microphone to our friend and member of IPCS, Mohib Nabulsi, who will um, do a, another intro. Um, the Institute, as I said, is a, an independent public education project. We're an autonomous project, right? So we're unaffiliated with any university. And um, this independence means that we can do particular kinds of things and, straight, and take strong positions, but also explore things in ways that perhaps the university and other such spaces sometimes don't allow. We interrogate colonial relations. That's what we do. And we do it through public facing events such as this one, but we also do it through a lot of careful work that happens in the, in the reading room over there through relations, right? Authentic relations with people and community. We have a visiting fellows program. We have several other spaces for discussion for that careful work that sometimes needs to happen behind closed doors. If you're not a member of IPCS yet, please consider taking up membership. It's a, it's a way in which to support the project. And um, as I said, we're independent, but that also comes with particular kinds of challenges, right? Financial and otherwise. And um, we can talk about that a little bit later. That's a good question. Um, I'm delighted that we're turning to Palestine in a public facing way tonight and we'll return. We'll stay with Palestine all week, right? So on Saturday, we'll have another panel with um, um, Ramzi Baroud, um, Tasneem Samak, Janine Lane, and Evelyn Araluen as well. But in a way, the discussion of Palestine and anti-colonial solidarity is always here present in IPCS on a regular basis in these closed behind doors discussions that we often have. With both panels, we're looking at themes that matter to us deeply, the ways in which so-called liberal progressive culture makes um, masks its colonial underside and the need to engage in and make spaces for vital anti-colonial critique. So real pleased that, we, that we're doing this. Um, I'd like to do a couple of quick thanks. Thanks to our friends over at APAN, the um, um, Australia Palestine Advocacy Network and Free Palestine Melbourne, um, you know, friends of IPCS with whom we've been collaborating on this. In particular, I'd like to thank um, Noura Mansour, Tasneem Samak, um, and Michael Sahar. There's a few other names as well. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, you know, friends of IPCS, members of the IPCS working group who are here um, pitching in. Um, John, Henry Porter, Shahed Esad Blul, and um, Tim Gentles was around there somewhere. Um, and of course, it's a pleasure to have Sari Makdisi and Jordi Silverstein here with us. Um, having said that, I'll pass on, on to our good friend, Muhib. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, my name is Muhib Nabilisi. I'm a Palestinian writer based here in Nam. I'm going to keep it super brief. I just want to introduce our two amazing guests tonight, um, one of whom you may not be familiar with, uh, one of whom I'm sure you are familiar with. Um, firstly, my left, this is Seri Makdisi. Um, 
He's a professor of English and um, comparative literature at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, his recent books include Tolerance is a Wasteland, Palestine and the Culture of Denial, most pertinently for tonight's discussion. Um, he's also written on Palestine with um, Palestine Inside Out, an everyday occupation um, from 2008. And his books on English literature um, are many, including Romantic Imperialism, Universal Empire, and the Culture of Modernity, and Making England Western, Occidentalism, Race, and Imperial Culture. Okay, and the person I'm sure you're familiar with is Jordana Silverstein, <laughs> a senior research fellow in the Melbourne Law School at the University of Melbourne. She's the author of Anxious Histories, Narrating the Holocaust in Jewish Communities at the Beginning of the 21st Century, and co-editor of In the Shadows of Memory, The Holocaust and the Third Generation, and also co-editor of Refugee Journeys, Histories of Resettlement, Representation, and Resistance. Her second book, Cruel Care, A History of Children at Our Borders, is forthcoming in May 2023, only a couple months away, with Monash University Publishing. A cultural historian, she researches histories of statelessness, Australian child refugee policies, and Australian Jewish history, focusing on questions of belonging, nationalism, identity, historiography, emotions, sexuality, and memory. Okay, so now I'm just going to hand over to Sadi here, um, who's going to talk for a bit. Um, I believe not an excerpt as such, but some of the material around his most recent book, um, A Culture of Denial. And then we're going to, um, Jordana is then going to speak for about 15 minutes or so, after which Sadi and Jordi will have be able to respond to each other's um, talks um, between themselves. And then I'll open up to questions from everyone here. And hopefully we'll have a bit of time left over uh, for that. But we are aiming to finish um, at 7.30. So thanks everyone for being here. And I'll hand over to you, Sadie. Uh, thank you, Mohib. Thank you, Carlos. Thanks to all of you for coming and to the Institute for hosting me. And like Carlos, I want to acknowledge the Wurundji, Woi, Wurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nation whose land this is and whose sovereignty was never ceded. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my new book, and then I'll talk about why my book is wrong, or, or rather, you'll see what has changed since I wrote the book. The book actually kind of talks about where things are going, have been going recently on the question of Palestine. And then I'll bring it up to kind of up to where we are right now with the debate around the redefinition or the attempted redefinition of uh, the concept of anti-Semitism. Um, a few things about the book then first, uh, and I'll try to keep this as informal as possible and then that way to open up to conversation as quickly as possible. But I'll just say a few things about the, the, the argument that I make in the book. Um, so the main question of the book is uh, to sort of tackle the, the question that I'm sure has occurred to most of you at one time or another, which is the contradiction that seems to constantly surface between people who are progressive on, on most you know, political issues, like women's rights or the environment or gay rights and so forth, um, and, and yet somehow reconcile or find, seem to find a way to reconcile their, prog their generally progressive politics or left politics with support for the Zionist project in Palestine, which ought to seem, that ought to be, at least in my mind, that's a contradiction because if you believe in progressive and left politics, you should believe in equality and justice and rights and not believe in usurpation, ethnic cleansing and apartheid, which is what the Zionist project in Palestine essentially amounts to. And so I've often wondered, as I, as I said, many of you, I'm sure have wondered the same thing. How, how can it possibly be that you can be progressive about everything under the sun except on this one thing where suddenly you, you, you're supporting this ultimately uh, repressive and despotic uh, state. Um, and so the book is, explores this contradiction. It explores how, how this could be. It explores the long legacy of support on the left in the West, meaning primarily Europe and, and the US, but I assume the same dynamic unfolds here in Australia, um, so that, again, to speak primarily of the place I know best, the US, 
support for the Zionist project in Palestine was always historically strongest on the left. Well, what passes for the left in the US, which is the Democratic Party, um, rather than on the right, that there is now in increasing support on the right for Israel, but its support for has, has traditionally been a left-wing thing, not so much of a right-wing thing in the US and also in Europe as well. Um, if you think about the great French intellectuals of the left in the 1960s, for example, Jean-Paul Sartre, for example, was a Zionist, Michel Foucault was an advocate for Israel and so forth. Uh, there were very few exceptions. Gilles Deleuze is one, Jean Genet is another, but by and large, the French left was adamantly pro-Israeli all through the 60s, 70s, on into the 80s, and so forth. So the book asks the question, how, how, you know, how do we understand this? How could it be? How, how can this phenomenon take place. What I argue is that they're the only way to understand it fundamentally is not that people like this are being hypocritical, but rather that they're engaging in a form of denial. This is at least my explanation. If you have your own explanation, I'm happy to hear it, but this is my way of understanding this, this what ought to be a paradox or contradiction. And the two for, there's two main forms of, of denial in play. One form is uh, is basically you know misinformation and disinformation of which as i'm sure you also know there's a great deal up to this day con concerning the zionist conflict with the palestinian people um so bad journalism sloppy coverage governments that are you know relentlessly looking you know staring right through the facts rather than actually engaging with historical and political circumstances so to a certain extent denial like saying oh i don't know what's happening you could almost understand it up to a certain point, at least for a certain duration, you could almost understand those forms of denial. But, but even so, enough of what was actually, what has been unfolding in Palestine on the ground from the Nakba, the ethnic cleansing of 1948, all through the various forms of occupation, various bombardments, sieges of Gaza and so forth, it's hard just to rely on that kind of denial. There's a sort of subset of that kind of denial, which is, Israel's own forms of obfuscation and equivocation and distortion that it that also facilitates a, kind, a form of denial based on like people not knowing what's going on. I can give you one example, we can come back and talk about it later, which is the distinction in Israeli law between the categories of citizenship and of nationality, which is super important. Because if you know anything about Israel, they always say we treat all of our citizens equally which is kind of true. They treat their Palestinian citizens equally to their Jewish citizens because the category of citizenship as such doesn't really matter. It doesn't count for very much. What matters in the Israeli legal system is what the state calls national identity, which is what international law understands as racial, the, the, international, the concept of international law is racial group, so basically race. Um, and that's what, so every Israeli citizen is given at, at birth or on their entry into the state's population registry, they're given, they're identified by the state as having a certain national identity. The one that really matters is Jewish national identity for the state. And then on the basis of that, you have access to, or you, you're, you're denied a whole range of rights of various kinds, above all when it comes to the land. So that, for example, somebody who is Jewish, but not a citizen of the state actually has when it comes to land in particular, has more has access to more rights than a Palestinian citizen who is not Jewish. So this contradiction, and you know, and the, like I didn't know this. I mean, I didn't know it until I did research. And the fact that somebody like me has to sit there and sift through things and go through tedious documents and you know parse the parse Israeli law and so forth, it shouldn't like this should be much more obvious than it really is. You know, if you look at the South African version of apartheid. It was much, much, much more brutally in your face. You're black, you're white, because you're black, you live here, you're white, you get to live there, and so on. It wasn't, there wasn't, there weren't all these layers of mystification and denial and obfuscation and equivocation at which the Israelis are specialists. So all this helps a kind of denial because people can say, well, I mean, nobody told me, I didn't know. And you could almost, you can't quite excuse them, but you can kind of, like you can see why one could deny what's happening because as I said, it takes some energy to figure these things out. But there's a, another form of denial, which is the one that the book is primarily interested in, which is a logic of uh, what I call affirmation, uh, of, sorry, denial through affirmation. 
And this is what the book spends most of its time talking about. And I, it, that sounds, I know, I, I know that sounds sort of like an, like an abstraction. So I'll formulate it for you in the abstract, and then I'll give a couple of concrete examples to help it kind of sink in. So to rephrase it again, the way this last mechanism of denial works is it enables people who support Israel or the Zionist project in Palestine to affirm a wonderful value, like, for example, gay rights or human rights or the environment or democracy or sustainability, these kinds of things that anybody on the, you know, who with progressive or left politics will automatically want to identify with because who doesn't support gay rights or women's rights or the environment and so on, or democracy, et cetera. Right? So you can loudly affirm these values, but through the, in the way it works on the ground, through the very affirmation of these wonderful left or progressive values, they transact a form of denial of the Palestinian presence on the land and the Palestinian claim to the land, right? So I told you that sounds a bit abstract. I recognize that. Let me give you some examples to help this kind of to concretize it. After the Nakba of 1948, the Israelis took about 15 years, or sometimes a little bit more, to demolish the hundreds and hundreds of Palestinian towns and villages that had, whose inhabitants had been driven from their homes. About 500 and over 500 towns and villages were demolished after 1948. After the demolitions took place, very, very, very methodically, the Israelis, or rather more specifically, primarily, not only, but primarily the Jewish National Fund, which is a which what which actually predates the state and is today like a parastatal organization, uh, planted forests over the ruins of these villages to make them disappear, basically to, 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 to green the landscape. And in the process, very methodically, like it's not a coincidence where these forests are planted. They're planted primarily over the ruins of Palestinian towns so that you don't see the towns, you don't see the ruins. What you see is an, what looks like an alpine vista. And, uh, and, and so, and as you know, if you know anything about Israel, you know it's constantly proclaiming how wonderful it is about making the desert bloom and making a barren, a barren allegedly barren, landscape fertile and green and so on, planting forests. And if you go to the website of the Jewish National Fund, which still does this stuff to this day, you're going to see it's planted, I don't know, how, whatever they, they have some some statistic about how many, they planted more trees in this one country than anybody's planted in the history of humanity ever. And they're, they're wonderful. They don't tell you about the olive trees, hundreds of thousands of which they've uprooted and the citrus groves near Yaffa that they've uprooted and so forth. But they tell you about how many trees they've planted. So what they're able to do is to tell people around the world, not you know heavily Jewish you know, audiences above all, but all but other sort of progressive and, and left audiences as well. Hey, we're planting trees to make the environment healthier. These days it's all about global warming, but in the 1950s and 60s and 70s it was all about planting and greening and making the desert bloom and this kind of thing. And on the basis of that, they could appeal to left and liberal people to say, hey, so, you know, give money, donate, help us plant trees, come visit the tree. You can, they give you a little card that says where your little sapling was planted and this kind of thing. And so they could gain support on the basis of what looks like a wonderful project of, you know, vegetative regeneration and so forth. What they don't tell you, of course, is that the, the trees, you know, in, in participating in this wonderful progressive project, you're also participating effectively in a project of ethnic cleansing because you're covering over the traces of the ethnic cleansing that took place in 1948 and has been going on ever since. So that's one example of how the affirmation of this wonderful value, in this case, greening the landscape, is also the denial of the Palestinian presence on the land, right? So you don't, you don't, just, you don't just bluntly, as somebody progressive or on the left, you're not gonna say, I support ethnic cleansing and home demolition because that's not a progressive value. I support planting trees, that is a progressive value. Right, but you can see what I'm saying, right? The, 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 these are two sides of the same coin. Affirmation and denial are not opposites. They are two sides of the same coin. They go, they're coextensive, they go, they go together. I'll give you one more quick example, then I'll move on to some other things. Um, the, the book is called Tolerance as a Wasteland. And so the concept of tolerance is one of these wonderful values that I talk about in the book. It comes out of a project uh, well, that that began in the in the uh, 1990s. Uh, there's a museum in Los Angeles called the Museum of Tolerance, which sounds sounds like a wonderful place. It's it's primarily a museum of Zionism, 
Um, although they do plenty of other exhibitions about other, like it's not, it's sort of a Holocaust museum, but it's not, it's not really only a Holocaust museum. They have stuff about the Holocaust, but they have, they do other, they do, they do look at other kind of humanitarian catastrophes. They have, uh, they have did a lot of, a lot of, spent a lot of time in the 1990s talking about uh, East Africa and North Africa and so forth. Ne of course, they never talk about Palestine. Um, but this is a, it's a heavily Zionist institution connected to the Simon Wiesenthal Center. And so in the mid 90s, these guys decided they wanted to build a branch in Jerusalem. And the site that, that they, that, that the municipality, of course, the Jewish municipality of Jerusalem gave them on occupied land was the, the oldest and largest and most historically important Muslim cemetery in all of Palestine. So they began this project of building a museum of tolerance on the ruins of a cemetery from which they, and of course, as soon as they, this was announced, the Muslim community in Jerusalem and Palestine and Palestinians and you know people elsewhere said, you, you, yeah, you can't you go build a museum of tolerance, but not on somebody else's graveyard. There's something, can you see this? There's a contradiction. You can't, you know, this is not done. It's, it's sort of rude, if nothing else. You don't, and the, but they just plowed ahead. And by plowed, I mean, like, literally, they plowed, they plowed up the earth. There are bits of the cemetery, I should say, that are still intact. I mean, they're covered over with weeds. They're not tended. The graves are crumbling. They're in an appalling condition. Part of Israel's so-called Independence Park is built on another part of the, of the same cemetery, which is also kind of amazing. So that if you go to Israel's Independence Park in Jerusalem, you, you're literally, your kids can go play in between the ruins of the Palestinian graves to celebrate Israel's independence. I mean, there's a kind of, there's a depth of, I'm not a psychoanalyst, but I think there's a depth of, of pathology here that's worthy of some kind of psycho, psychological investigation. That's not what I do. But so they built this museum, they, you know, they proceeded with this, this project to build this museum of tolerance. And here again, you can see the same structure in play, right? What are we doing? We're not desecrating a graveyard. We're not removing bodies or skeletons in the dark of night and dumping them in cardboard boxes, no. We're affirming tolerance. Who could be against tolerance? Are you against tolerance? I'm sure you're all for tolerance, right? Well, guess what? Tolerance in this case means the desecration of a graveyard. So again, by enlisting, by very, very loudly proclaiming this progressive value, they're transacting, in this case, basically a kind of post-mortem, I don't even know how to describe it, like a post-mortem removal of uh, ethnic cleansing of dead bodies, basically. There's a subset to the story, which is that the original architect of the of this venture was Frank Gehry, the LA-based, actually Santa Monica-based architect. You know, yeah, yeah, I think he has stuff in Australia, but certainly he's got he's you know he did Walt Disney Concert Hall in LA, and he's done the the Bilbao and in, in, uh, sorry the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao and many other structures. So it was going to be one of these titanium swirling titanium things of Frank Gehry's. And this is the one place where I can, my tiny little claim to fame is that I wrote an article about this museum project in a journal called Critical Inquiry. And then there was a debate that I had with Frank Gehry and the museum afterwards. And in the, in the wake of that, he withdrew his services from the project. So that's one thing I've helped to bring about, but it still went ahead and they got another architect after he withdrew and then a third architect after that guy withdrew and so forth. Um, what Just to wrap up this museum thing, because I think it's it's indicative of this larger structure. Today, the museum planned, so there's a big sort of white and steel and glass building uh, and concrete building, uh, and, but like the above ground spaces are all like, you know, the gift shop and the, you know, the, the cafe and things like that. The exhibition spaces, and it's worth pointing out, the exhibitions are, it's so Museum of Tolerance, you think it's about I don't know, whatever, whatever you would expect to see in a museum about tolerance. It's not about tolerance. It's basically a history of the Jewish people kind of, but teleologically taking us to Zionism. So it's basically a history, a re-narration of the history of the Jewish people as the history of Zionism. So conflating Judaism or the history of Judaism anyway with Zionism. And so all of the exhibitions spaces for this museum are located in what the Israeli architect, after Gary withdrew, the Israeli architect, he calls uh, the exhibition spaces, he says they take place in a black box, which is below ground. And again, if you think about what that means, just not symbolically, literally, materially, they went to a graveyard, they removed the bodies from the graveyard, they inserted what this architect calls a black box, literally where the graves had been, like literally in the earth, where the graves had been. And in this coffin, 
of a museum, they have this exhibition in the name of tolerance, which is really a history of Zionism. I mean, I think you can tell. I think it's a perverse project. But the but the point is, this this these mechanisms of denial were very 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 effective, and they enabled the Israelis to conscript liberal and left. Not liberal, I know, it means a different thing in Australia than in the U.S. Left and progressive audiences to back them all the way through the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and so forth. And that more or less held until, I think, it's hard to know exactly when, but I, I would say sometime in the 2000s. Specifically, I think, if you if you're to look for specific dates of when these narratives of liberalism and wonderful progressive values began to crumble a little bit, it was specifically the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 2006, which shocked people for its unbelievable violence. And then shortly afterwards, the, that series of bombardments of Gaza, 2008, 9, 2014, and, and so on, which again shocked people because no matter what the Israelis were telling the world, when you, you know, you could see, you, you know, you don't need to have a PhD in political science or international theory to, or legal theory to see, to understand what's happening. You can see what's happening with your own eyes. You see a big urban space like Gaza with smoke and flames and ruins and you know the sh the shrapnel and the the phosphorus all all that stuff and again it sort of no matter what the israeli narrative was people were seeing right through it at this point so they began to, there was like a crisis of this these discourses of 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 tolerance and you know progressive values that began i think in the 2000s and they've kind of they've been sort of accelerating um since then another couple of factors in this sort of crisis that the Israelis have been dealing with since the 2000s has been um, the the kind of weakening of main, at least in the U.S. of mainstream media accounts and coverage of the conflict. So people, these like if you in the 1960s or 70s to find out what was going on, you had to turn to the mainstream media. There, there were very very few alternative sources of information, and by the time of the internet, alternative sources of information like, for example, electronic intifada and others began to pop up so you could get closer to the truth than what the New York Times was was giving you, for example. So that that led also to change in perceptions of Israel. And then, of course, the, the, the proliferation of Palestinian voices in proper American or English or Australian accented English, um, again, pre presenting the Palestinian story in a way that hadn't really been there before. I mean, if you think about the Edward Said's The Question of Palestine was published in 1979. That was not that, I mean, it sounds like a long time, but it wasn't that long ago. It was basically the dawn of the 1980s. And until then, think about how many Palestinian voices there were in English in the Western world. There weren't many, really, there weren't many. I mean, Said kind of broke, broke incredible new ground. And then, you know, 15, 20 years after him, where there were more and more Palestinian voices writing fiction and telling stories and journalism and all kinds of things that made the Palestinian narrative compete more equitably with the Israeli one. So we enter this period of crisis and, and that brings us up to today where I think, at least I argue in the book, that this narrative of denial that kind of helped sustain Israel for all those decades began cracking and crumbling and falling apart. People weren't buying it anymore. They weren't, they didn't believe it anymore. They, no matter how hard the Israelis tried, they just, they were selling something that people weren't buying anymore essentially. And so what we start to see at that point, this is now in the, we're talking in the mid to late 2000s and onto our own time, is a couple of things. One, a shift, again, I could speak mostly to the US, a marked shift in where the support for Israel is in the US primarily, and you can speak to your own context here, you know it more than I do, from the left to the right. So support for Zionism in the US increasingly is something connected to not the Democratic Party, but rather the Republican Party, which means explicitly racist, anti-immigrant, anti-black, homophobic, and you know, and, and so forth, uh, misogynistic, et cetera, the, that right-wing culture in the US. That's where the center of gravity for support is in the US. This is not on the left anymore, it's on it's on the right. And the second thing is, and this is just as important the israeli state itself has been shedding all these all the forms of denial that i wrote that whole book about so it's been saying more and more and more explicitly no actually we no we we really are a racist project so for example in 2018 they passed a pivotal law called the jewish nation state law which didn't you know and again kind of i'll come to the present day government which is which is shocking people who used to support the state around the world because it's so brutally nakedly obvious what they're up to 
nothing, nothing that's happening, neither now in the new government nor in the 2018 law, nothing is materially new. These are things they'd always been doing, but what's shifted is they're now saying it rather than denying it. That's the big shift. So the forms of racial discrimination that had obtained among citizens of the state, you know, from 48 until, until 2018, that were mostly de facto and they, they could be arranged, it was subtle and it wasn't, you know, in your face, became explicit after the 2018 law. It basically rendered explicit and de jure what had been de facto forms of racial discrimination within the state. The new government that came to power recently, as I'm sure you now announced on its on a taking government, that the Jewish people have an exclusive right to the land, what they call the land of Israel, which of course we call Palestine, which is present day, the present day state plus the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem. And so if the Jew, which is also saying something that 2018 law says. So if the Jewish people have an exclusive claim to the land, then by definition, the other people who make up about half the population of that land, all in all, uh, not to mention that refugees and exiles who add another several million people, have no right. I mean, that, that's what it means. But if, if one party to, 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 a, to a conflict has exclusive claim, the other party has zero claim, by definition. It's a zero-sum game stated like that. So it's been made much more explicit. So all those mechanisms of forms of denial are no longer, the Israelis are jettisoning them. They don't, they think, I think they're making a mistake, but that's not my problem. They think, we don't need these things because now we're going to go with the right. We're going to go with Trump and Modi and, you know, Ur uh, Orban and people like that, Bolsonaro in Brazil and so on, um, rather than trying to continue inculcating this left and progressive audience that has sustained us for 70 plus years. So my book, in that sense, is an archaeology of a crumbling, uh, crumbling institution of, of denial. Um, which brings us up to the present day, and I'll just say a few things about the present day, and then we'll see what Jordi says. Um, the Where we are right now is in the face of increasingly explicit Israeli racism. What we see is the people who are still defending the Israeli state in, in the West. Again, I don't know enough about the Australian context, you can tell me, but in the US and Europe, which I do know, they are, especially the US, they are in constant panic mode now, constant panic mode, running around with a fire extinguisher trying to use carbon dioxide to put out the oxygen of free thought wherever they can, just anywhere they can. S passing, pushing, you know, lobbying to have legislation passed to outlaw BDS, which is the case in most of the states of the US at this point. Pushing universities to banish and end and terminate and render illegal criticism of the Israeli state as what they would call racism and so on, doing these kinds of things. Which you know, which which are which are basically a, a, a rec I think a recognition that they've lost all the arguments, and now basically they want to destroy argument itself. They want to terminate argument. They want to make it impossible for people to argue, to read, to think, to criticize, to write, and so forth. Which I think, or I'd like to think, is is an impossible. I mean, I think it, I think that's a futile endeavor on their part. You can't stop people thinking. At least not in the U.S. And you know, and I know in the U.S. we have protections of freedom of speech that I, mean, I don't know about Australia, but I mean, certainly in the U.S. there are what the problem that the Israelis keep having, or their lobbyists keep having, is they keep running into our constitutional protections of freedom of speech, which basically they can't get around that. They've tried all kinds of maneuvers; it's not working. We can still we still have the right to express ourselves in the U.S. So that's where they are now. It's it's absolute you know, almost like every person for themselves panic mode on their part. Um, and so on this note, I want to talk a little bit about this, their latest version, which I think is maybe the culmination of all of these attempts at censorship, which is their attempt to redefine the concept of anti-Semitism, to include criticism of the Israeli state, and which, which, you know, I could tell, I have my notes here to tell you the history of that project. I'll just throw a few key dates out because it's interesting to track where this where this came from. And it begins in 2004 in an obscure body in the bowels of the European Union called the EU Monitoring Center on Racism and Xenophobia, which in consultation with the American Jewish Committee uh, came up with what they called a working definition of anti-Semitism, which included not just I th what I think is real anti-Semitism, you know, racism against Jewish people, which is what I understand anti-Semitism to actually be, so, you know, a whole bunch of examples of, of racism against Jewish people, which is fine. That is what anti-Semitism is. Uh, 
And then on top of that, oh yeah, but also if you single out Israel for criticism, or if you say that it doesn't have a right to exist, or if you criticize it and so forth, that's also anti-Semitism. And but this definition, as far as this organization was concerned, was merely a working definition, which it soon, within a few years, said, actually, this is not really workable because we're we're conflating things that are actually different and they're 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 categorical. You can't really have this kind of thing. For example, to equate criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism would be like in the 1980s, let's say, if you were to criticize white South Africa, I mean, the apartheid regime in South Africa, that would be saying, oh yeah, you you're, you hate white people. You know, like, no, you don't. You just don't like that particular political formation and its policies. Or to criticize Iran today is to be anti-Shia or to criticize Saudi Arabia because of its repressive laws is to be anti-Sunni or anti-Muslim. And of course, no, it's not. You can, you can distinguish between hate of a people or a religion or an ethnicity or whatever it is and and criticism of of a vicious, violent, and racist state formation and its attendant policies. I mean, these are these should be different things. So anyway, long story short, the EU gave up on this definition. But by then, it was sort of like the genie was out of the bottle. And then Israel's lobbyists assiduously in Europe, relentlessly. I know in Australia too, in the U.S., they've been pushing this wherever they can trying to get governments to adopt it, trying to get universities, above all universities. Universities are their dreaded, the, the place they hate the most are universities because all this damn free speech and thinking that goes on in universities, they can't, they just can't stand it. So to be able to stifle that at universities became, that's why universities are, their, are the, one of the key battlegrounds right now, which is why this definition is being pushed so hard on universities around the world. We can go into further details, but I'll just, you know, just this is where this is essentially where where this thing is. So having the EU drop this definition, because I said it was unworkable, it was then picked up in 2016, having been abandoned by the EU, it was picked up by an organization called the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, which is basically a club of EU states, above all Germany, rightly guilty for the for the crimes of the Holocaust and centuries of European anti-Semitism and trying to atone for that. I think they should atone. I think they're right to be guilty about it. But they're the one of the ways they decided to try to atone for European, in particular German guilt over the Holocaust, was to redefine anti-Semitism. And they added yet more definitions specifically to 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 make criticism of the Israeli state illegitimate and to reclassify them as as anti-Semitism and so forth. And so that's where we are now is this 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 is the the so-called the, the infamous IRA definition of anti-Semitism, and you know it's. I, I gather it's been adopted by at least one or two Australian universities, four you know, Australian universities, and at my university, the University of California, there was a major campaign in 2016, actually 2015, and then again in 2016 to have the University of California adopt this definition. The university regions, who are like our governing body of the entire UC system, to their credit, said we can't this, we can't do this because for I mean obviously we can't do that. And there was a huge battle that was fought rhetorically at one of the UC regions meetings where this thing was debated. And in the end, the, what the regions came up with was we what we will we will condemn anti-Semitic forms of anti-Zionism, which the other side took as a victory. They they proclaimed victory, but of course that's not a victory because what it's saying is. If there are, if you can condemn anti-Semitic forms of anti-Zionism, then by definition, there are forms of anti-Zionism that are not anti-Semitic. I mean, that's you know, that's there. So that's where we are now. That's that's where that's where the fight is. And the, the one last thing I want to say, then I'll hand over to Jordi, is is that you know when you look at this this incredible power to to try to stifle thought, to try to suffocate free inquiry, criticism of of state policies, and so forth. Um, to to really to 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 operate in this kind of Orwellian way with language, you know, so that so that what I think is is a racist endeavor to discriminate between Jews and non-Jews in historical Palestine gets reclassified as tolerance, and therefore, by definition, criticism of that project becomes intolerance. Like this is an abuse of the English language and every other language too, for that matter. Um, you know, to to redefine the 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 criticism of racism as itself racist, which is what this redefinition of anti-Semitism is. I mean, this is like stretching 
the English and other languages to their breaking point. The languages don't function like this anymore. They start to lose coherence and meaning. I mean, we're, we're really kind of in an, in an Orwellian world if this goes on in the way that it has been. So when you look at this, you might think, wow, these people are really, I mean, they're incredibly organized and they have you know, funding and they, they have their act together and they have institutions and all people working for them and so on and so forth. But in my point of view, or from my point of view, this is not a sign of strength. It's a sign of absolute weakness, right? You don't need to push language to its breaking point if you're confident in the position that you hold. This is an attempt to kind of, the, you know, the horse, the horse has bolted the, the barn you're trying to, you, and you're trying to close the barn. It's too late. It's over in that sense. And I think that's kind of where we are now. So there are reasons for pessimism and, and concern, especially in academic settings where these kinds of things are adopted, as I gather is, is happening here. But I think there are also reasons for hope, which is that this is an increasingly impossible, unsustainable position that they're trying to hang on to. And I don't think it can go on for much longer. So thank you. The nation state. Uh, I don't think the nation state was ever much of a solution, even in the question of Palestine. I, I never personally thought that. I think if we go back to people like Franz Fanon, the wretched of the earth, he's the one who teaches us in the middle of a nationalist struggle, the nation state is not the end. It's like that's not we need we need new concepts other than the ones the Europeans invented. He's very clear about that in the very end of in the conclusion to the wretched of the earth. So I think. That's that's an important thing. I would the only thing the only I would it's the only thing I would add to what Jordi was saying is that I would say we also need to think about the ways in which existence can be diasporic for those of us who want to be diasporic, which I personally don't mind. But there are people who want to go home, and we have to also recognize that too. Which I, I'm sure you I mean I'm, you know I'm I'm sure for, you didn't mean to not say that, but. I want to just reemphasize that as well, that people people's right to return to their homes is indisputable. It's, uh, you know, nobody should not have the right. To, well, let me put that positively so that we don't talk about linguistic bastardization here. Everybody has the right to go home. Everybody should enjoy their right to return to their homes and nobody should be blocked from doing so. And that's, of course, primarily what the state of Israel is, is from a Palestinian point of view, is it's a block on you cannot. You know, thou shalt not pass, and and Palestinians want to return. Um, whether they end end up wanting to live there, you know, actually, or whether they whatever is the right is theirs, and, and the right needs to be recognized and left to them to figure out how whether they want to continue to embrace this diasporic existence, which which is true. Many of us don't don't feel, you know, don't want to be cocooned in the in the you know in, in a nation state, especially a milit militaristic nation state. So yeah, but. Otherwise, I'm I'm on board. Yeah, yeah, and I guess Sari and Jordi, for both of your um, comments, I just wanted to say with the IHRA stuff that's going on at Melbourne Uni, um, specifically, and maybe I can say this because Melbourne Uni does not pay my wage. Um, uh,